Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zev from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am down to see Lee Stoffer. Lee, how are you doing? I'm good mate, are you? Not too bad, thank you. Good. So if you're not familiar with Lee, Lee has made an appearance on my channel for a few years now and I've filmed a myriad of videos with him. Now in this video, what we're going to be looking at is Lee's going to be showing his personal process for making a leather sheath for a spoon knife. Now this particular video is a continuation of a mini series we'll be, we've been doing looking at all sorts of sheaves you can make specifically for spoon stroke hook knives. If you haven't seen the previous videos, I would highly recommend you do so. Links to all of those will be down below in the description. In case you're not familiar with Lee Stoff, and this is the first video you're seeing with him in it, or even me, Lee is a professional green woodworker and also tool maker. So he really, really knows his stuff and has a lot of experience when it comes to this particular skill set. So like I said, in this video, we're gonna be looking at a certain style of leather sheath for a spoon hook knife. In this mini series we filmed in general, we have looked at a couple of other variations. So once again, links down below will be in the description. So Lee, with your kind permission, shall we get started? Let's do it. So guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. So Lee, where would you like to begin? Well, uh, let's look at a couple of different types of knife, I guess, and we're gonna hopefully attempt to do two different options of sheath today. They're both gonna be wet molded, to accommodate the shape of the blade and we're going to look at a, a version that you don't have to stitch and then a version that you do stitch so depending on what tools people have got available what skills they've got they can try either or or a combination of the two so this is one that I've already wet molded to a more a blade that is a more open sweep this is actually a double-edged one which I'm not a big fan of but you know it still needs protection and so you can see that the leather's been wet molded to the point where it kind of holds a shape, but none of the hardware has been fitted. So this will be the no stitch, where we've just folded this leather over and then molded it around this blade so it kind of holds the shape of the blade. So what we'll do is rivet this one and then put a snap fastener here to accommodate that blade. For this more curvy blade, I think this having this fold is likely to pucker when you bend it around a tighter curve so what we're going to do is use a different method where we're going to come up and over with a longer shape so this is like a template for it so that will effectively sit in behind the blade the leather will come up and around and be then be stitched down one side so that's like our stitch line um, we're going to do a really basic version with no welt so there's the stitching is just holding two pieces of leather together. You could make a slightly wider version and put a welt in like you would in a conventional knife sheath that'll actually protect the stitching from the edge when it sits in there. But just to keep things really simple, we're gonna do this basic version. And what we're probably gonna do is come around here, stitch this, and then so that we don't have to set a stud or a snap fastener, where this wraps around, we're just gonna tie on a piece of cord that wraps around. So this will be the stitched version, but no, um, no, no setting of fasteners required. This one will be set in fasteners, but no stitching required. What you could obviously do is sew it up and put a snap fastener on if you've got the, the time, the tools, and the inclination to do so. So, and then we'll show, obviously show the process of wet molding to this shape. The pr trouble with wet molding is it takes time. You've got to wait for the leather to dry. So this is why I've sort of pre-molded this one so that we can show the process of finishing one and starting one from scratch in the one, in the one day. So just a couple of quick things to touch upon before we begin the tutorial itself. So in this instance, we're using a Mora 164, which yeah. is obviously a very common yeah. uh, uh, spoon knife. Absolutely. Um, and a side note that this Mora was provided to us by the team over at Classic Handles. Um, if people are not familiar with Classic Handles, Lee, how would you describe Classic Handles? Awesome. They're great. They've got such a brilliant selection of tools and they're really lovely people as well. So yeah, if it's hand tools you're after, Go and check them out. Yeah, absolutely. So a link to that will be down below in the description. Um, the second thing is, um, obviously we're working at the moment in this video with a Mora, but obviously needless to say, the principles here, and it's kind of two-folded. Number one, obviously you apply this to whatever spoon knife that you're going to be making it for. Um, and secondly, what you're showing here is obviously just some variations, but obviously, would I be right in saying that people can be playful and kind of experiment around with kind of what you're going to be showing? Absolutely, yeah. That's why I thought if we try and do two different types, you can take whatever element of each type 
that you think is going to suit the job that you've got on. I'll say, I think this one where you're folding it, there's no stitching to cut there, there's none to do. And you'll say you've got a solid piece of leather where the edge of the knife is. So, I, but I do think it lends itself better to a more open sweep, this particular design, just folding the leather over. The more that you bend that leather, the more it's likely to want to pucker up on the inside and, and close up on the outside. So I, I just think that for a more open sweep knife, this style's going to be fine. But you might find that you can make it work. So by all means, experiment with it. That's, you know, we're, we're just playing with ideas here, really. Obviously, the tools I make, this isn't really an option. So what I have done in the past, which is even simpler, is use really thin leather and just stitch together two strips of it and carefully feed it onto the blade. But it's a real faff and you definitely wouldn't want to be doing that onto a really tight curve. Um, so this, I think this open edged version obviously is a little bit more practical when it comes to it. What you do need to be careful of is what type of leather that you're going to use. So I've got a few different sort of types out here. This is a raw veg tan leather, undyed, unfinished, perfectly suitable for wet molding. Um, but obviously you want to apply some kind of dye and a finish to it. This is a dyed version of the same stuff. Again, it's wet moldable because it's not got a finish on the back, so it's still going to still going to soak up the water necessary. This has got a dye, and it looks like it's got a little bit of a finish on it, maybe as well. And it's also quite stiff. What we don't want for this, where we're going to bend it, is a really thick leather. I think it wants to be, you know, no thicker than two millimeters. Um, so we've got a selection here, but this one is totally different. This is a chrome tanned leather, so this is the sort of stuff that would be used for for boots generally. Um, and because of the tanning process, it's not, as far as I'm aware, I've never tried, but it's, I've been told that this will not wet mold the same way because of the type of tanning process and it's not gonna soak up the water as much. It's designed to be a bit more water resistant. So it, and it's also quite floppy. So you're gonna want a leather that before you've wet molded it is reasonably stiff. So that when it's wet molded and it takes that shape, it, it goes back to that reasonably stiff state. So it's gonna hold the shape. So this, I'll just check, quickly check this and measure it. This is the stuff that we're actually going to use, this pre-dyed stuff. And we are looking at, yeah, look, it's just under two millimetres. And I think that's going to be about right for this particular project. Anything around, it's going to vary throughout the hide, but any, yeah, anything around the sort of two millimetre mark, I think should work quite well. Okay, so I've just basically made a template out of paper before we're going to worry about trying to cut it out of the leather. It's going to be much easier just to fold the paper around the knife. And if you notice, this this is a right-handed knife, so the edge is on this, on the outside, it's on the right-hand side of the knife. And if you notice, that makes this basically an L shape, the template that we're going to use. So we want this tab to be on the spine side of the knife. I've just butted that up to the to the bolster there, wrapped it round, allowing a little bit of space at the top there, and then basically folding it over and marking that as halfway. Obviously then fold it at the halfway point and cut that to the same length. Um, that wraps around and takes the shape of the blade. This bit will, will fold over whether you're putting a snap fastener on or tying it off. It's just going to help to locate the spine of the knife in there. But what's quite important is if we're going to use a leather that's got the, the slick side and then the suede side, is what, which is the inside, which is the outside. So this is the outside of the leather, this, this finished side, but this is the inside of the sheath. So obviously you want to turn this round. So what, it would be dead easy to cut that straight off the corner, right? But then when we fold it over, we're going to have the suede side on the outside. So it's quite important that you orientate it correctly. So I've marked the inside of this and then let's just lay it on the inside of the leather. So just as a general principle for those who haven't done leather work before, uh, you would always advise to do a paper template first. It's just, well, it doesn't have to be paper. What I quite often use is um, something, if it's there's something a bit more substantial that you're not gonna have to bend around a shape, what's quite good is like, I've cut some vinyl flooring because it's a similar thickness to the leather and it's got a similar kind of tension to it. So if you say if you're looking to wrap something around a handle and get an idea of the size, you can 
use a similar thickness material. But for this particular purpose, I wanted to be able to just bend it around the blade really easily. So paper was, yeah, by far the best solution for that, I thought. Um, we'll lay this on and mark it out as kind of efficiently as we can. So we'll leave that corner because that potentially do a left-handed version. So we're going to get that out of there. We can just mark this up. Biro is quite good for actually marking this. So I'll just grab one of those. You know, if you're marking on normal undyed veg tan leather, it'll mark on either side, but it will not come off. Biro kind of changes the chemical structure of leather, but you can you can sort of see it. And it'll, if even on this darker coloured leather, I should be, still be able to see this, or if nothing else, it will leave a little bit of an indent. So we're just going to mark that up. And I've basically just made this template very slightly wider than the blade itself, obviously because we're going to be stitching some of it together, so we need to leave a little bit of space in there. So if I just lay that on, you can see where the, there's the stitch line and that the widest part of the blade is going to accommodate it. Obviously the blade thins out towards the end, so there's a little bit of space inside. But you can basically see the shape on there, hopefully. I always find for cutting leather, there's lots of different fancy knives that you can buy, but just a, a normal utility knife works really well. Put a fresh blade in it, and then I will always, to get the best results, just strop that blade a little bit before I actually use it. It will cut the leather way more efficiently like that. When you've got sort of sharp internal corners like this, it's sometimes preferable to actually punch a hole. So these hole punches, you can get this sort that's got the wheel on it with all different sizes or you can get individual ones that you hammer on but if we take that corner and just punch out the actual corner that we're cutting up to make sure that anvil's lining up nicely crunch through it and then actually that little scrap there that's what I normally just pop that underneath we've got a brass die there for to punch down onto but they're going to remain sharper for longer if we don't come into contact with the, with the metal. So you see, I've just basically punched out on the corner. So now I'm going to run the knife line off of that. And it's not got a sharp corner that might eventually kind of tear putting the, by point, putting the point of the knife in. You can use a, because we've got straight edges, we might as well actually use a straight edge. So coming from just inside that, this is our point here that we're coming to. So I'm just going to put the knife in it's nice and sharp because we've stropped it. Come down to that point or just, just a little bit beyond it. And then come straight out there. This is our line here. So we'll take that off there. And then again, on the inside, it's not much, there's not much of a line there. So I'm just going to come inside that hole and just pull it out without the ruler. And that's the shape that we're going to need. So what we should find now is we should be able to just hold that on there and it will wrap around that blade. Because the internal space technically is slightly shorter, going around the outside is a slightly longer path than the inside. To get these to line up, you notice this is crept off the back now, so I'm gonna have to pull that back down and push that back inside. So this, this point here is gonna, we wanna leave a little bit of space here, basically, so we're not gonna take the stitching all the way to the end. And we could effectively cut this inside leg just a tiny little bit shorter, I think. So effectively, when we stitch it together. But just needless to say, for those watching, you gotta think about the spoon knife coming in and out, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. Which is where I think, in the best, in, you know, if you could be bothered gluing a little a welt, an extra piece, just like a straight, line of the leather inside that, that then encompasses the stitching is also going to give that capacity for the blade. Um, it's an extra stage that involves really gluing it in and then you've got extra thicknesses to punch through. So it, it does complicate the job a little bit, but I think realistically it probably wouldn't be a bad shout to do that. But we're just going to keep it simple for this. So that's, that's going to accommodate that blade, but because of the way that that's going to work, we're going to stitch it with those together and then let the, leave a little bit of room, wiggle room at the end there, basically. So that's really the next job now, is to stitch it. 
Right, so the next tool we're going to look at, which is not essential, this is a stitch groover. So what it effectively does, you can set this as a distance from this central post and it cuts a tiny little sliver of leather out to accommodate the stitching and set the stitching in flush with the surface of the leather, which helps to protect the stitching a little bit. It's not essential, but in this case, I happen to have one. So I'm just gonna run this. This will be the edge that we're stitching together. So like that's the bit that's coming over and that's folding over there. So this outside edge here is the bit that we're gonna stitch. So I'm just gonna set that on that edge there, run this down, all the way down, leaving a little gap at both ends. And that will just help to accommodate our stitching. These, you know, it's a handy tool to have if you're gonna do more leather work. And also, it, obviously it helps to define a nice straight line for the stitching. What we can then do is use this, which is a, an edge beveler. Again, not essential, but if you bevel the edge, you're just taking that edge off of the leather. It just kind of comes along and cuts a little bevel off and just helps to tidy it up. And it helps, makes it easier to burnish if you want to burnish it afterwards on the outside edge. So there are a couple of tools that, if you're going to do more than one project, they're not particularly expensive things to invest in. I, I think they're a good thing to have. So now we've got this, we could glue it together, but because it's a fairly simple design, it's, a, it's just a straight line. All I've got here is a piece of um, hardboard like this that I'm cutting on with some cork stuck onto it. Just the kind of thing that you'd get for like a pin board and then I've just taped it up. You can see the cork coming through where it's been punched on a lot of times. So I'm just gonna push this down onto there, hold it together at the end. You could put a bit of tape on it maybe just to secure it in the same position, but this is an awl. This is a tool that if you're gonna do leather work is definitely worth having, well, if you're gonna stitch leather together. It's a diamond shape, all right? So it cuts a specific hole that helps to lock the stitching together. So you're just gonna hold that together on that edge and push it down straight onto that board. And hopefully, if we push it down straight, it comes out into, in the groove on the opposite side. And this single thickness, this is why I've kind of opted for this. When it comes to stitching leather together, pushing this through can be difficult to get it dead straight the thicker the leather gets. If we put a welt in there, it makes that process that little bit harder. But now we've got that one hole that locates the end, what I'm going to actually do is take that out and just grab a needle just to pin that down. So this is just a little needle case, dead simple little project that you can make. I'm just going to pin that now with a needle so that we know that those stitches line up. There is another option, is if you lay this out flat, you can use something to mark your stitch positions and punch through a single thickness. Okay, there's various options for that. Um, again, they're an investment, but you can get things like these, which are like a set of awls in a row on a thing that you can actually lay on there and punch through. So you can tap the top of this with a hammer, on, obviously onto a softer surface. You don't want to be doing it onto anything too hard because you'll knock the points off them pretty quick. And you can tap that through, and you can do that from both ends and when you come to the middle, you know that that's a fixed distance so that everything will actually line up. But again, it's another investment. Just to keep things simple, I'm gonna go along and do it with the awl. What I've also done in the past is just a normal fork that you'd eat your dinner with, metal fork. You've got the four prongs, put your first prong on the first hole that you've punched, and then you can just go along and mark. Just press it in to give you a little mark to then guide your awl. But there's no real need. It's we're just, let's just do this as simply as we possibly can. So pin those first two holes back together with a needle. So sort of stick that into there, hold it down so it's nice and flat and the edges line up. And then we'll just go through with the awl and just eyeball the distance. We don't have, they don't have to be a fixed distance apart. Just try and keep them fairly even. Push the thing straight down, mind your fingers, because it is very sharp, obviously. So while you're doing that, for those watching at home, why specifically a diamond shape at all? The diamond shape helps to lock the stitching in. So it gives the, mid, the, the wider part in the center, 
gives room for the needle to actually travel through. And then when you, the, certain, the, the type of stitch that we're going to do is called a saddle stitch. So it's basically like you're tying a small knot in that gap and what the saddle stitch does is it kind of locks off each stitch as you stitch it. So those points of the diamond is where the actual thread pulls into. And it helps to just lock the stitching into place. You could technically punch the holes or drill them, but with this we're not removing any leather whatsoever. We're, we're kind of just pushing it out of the way to allow space for the needle and thread. So this is considered to be the, you know, the strongest, best option for actually stitching leather together. Just a couple more holes I think with there. I want to leave a little bit of wiggle room at the end so I'm just going to finish short of the end by about a stitch width and then we've got everything that we need. Alright so this is a a good time to mention our friends at Stonesfield Leather. Obviously you can see supply a huge array of different coloured threads and also a lot of the other stuff. The leathers actually come from them, um, some of the needles, they do the dyes, they do the tools. So if you're looking to get into leather work, go and check them out. This little gadget here that I'm setting up is mostly so that you can see what I'm doing better. You don't need one of these, but it's a handy thing. It's called a stitching pony or a saddler's pony and what it does is it's just going to hold the seam together you see I've still got my needle in there just to locate that um, and then we're going to I'll be able to show you this how you know I could hold this between my knees or just in my hands but I'm going to cover a lot of what I'm doing for you to film this if I do that so it's just going to be easier for you to see what I'm doing but again if you're going to be stitching a bit of leather they're a brilliant thing you can make it yourself you can buy one whatever you feel like they're not complicated but they're really quite handy things to have we're going to want a pair of saddler's needles you can see they've got quite a reasonable size eye maybe you can they've got quite a big eye to accommodate the thread but they're they're not long it's, it's a very strong eye and they're not particularly sharp I mean you don't want to stick one in you because they will <laughs> they will puncture skin but they're not sharp like a, a sewing needle would be because we've already punched the holes so they just need to find their way into it when it comes to measuring how much thread we're going to need obviously that's one length we're doing it twice so we need at least two lengths and then you're going to want enough to go through and a bit for the a bit what we call a bit for the needles so let's take twice what we need in terms of basically about four times your length if you're not putting a welt in is about right I think so one two three four and just a little bit for the needles if I'm going for um, something the thicker leather with a welt you're obviously using much more leather much more thread up inside the joint itself so I'd go like six times the length of the seam just so it's convenient to this is a waxed thread so I normally pinch it onto the needle and just pull it so it flattens it nicely to go through the eye. Just push it through, take a couple of inches through. Do not knot it onto the needles, just pull it back and it kind of sticks to itself a little bit. We're going to leave that one in there and there we go. Make sure we've pulled it a reasonably equal amount through on each needle because we're using the thread, let's nip that up a little bit so it holds it steady, we're using the thread from the centre so we want to pull that through and have an equal amount on each side so we want an equal amount coming through the needles just so we're using up the same amount of thread yeah so then we're going to take it two needles level with each other make sure that stays put find the next hole Push the first needle through from one direction and pull that through and then take the other needle back through the same hole. We want to make sure that we don't put the needle through the thread. So what I'm going to do is as I pull this through, push the needle through the hole and then pull the thread back with it so that we've not done anything in terms of pushing that 
needle through the thread like that because that will stop the knot from forming. So now we've got it through, we're just going to wrap that thread over that needle, push the needle all the way through and pull it. And then effectively, like the first part of tying your shoelace, we've got a half hitch knot that when we pull that tight, on the same length again, and just pull it up and we've pulled a little knot into that stitch. So that kind of effectively locks that stitch off. So if they do wear on the outside, then you don't lose the whole seam. So again, I'll just do it from the opposite direction this time. So I've pulled one needle through, line that second needle up with the hole, pull it back, pull the thread back with it to make sure we've not snagged it, pull that needle all the way through. And then again, we wanna make sure that we've gone effectively round that needle to tie that half hitch. Just did it slightly differently that way. I prefer to come from this side first. So we're gonna go through, take that back the other way, pull in the thread through, wrap it over once, and then pull it tight. And that's basically the process. And we just follow that all the way down the seam. Wrap once, pull it tight. Don't over, you know, we're just looking to set those stitches down into that groove that we've made in the leather. Don't want to pull it stupidly hard because it's a very strong thread. So it could cut into your fingers and it could also pull through to, you know, through to the next hole in the leather if we really yank on it. So it's just to set it. We want to try and keep a e fairly even tension when we do that as well. You'll find that when you're putting that second needle through, it can be quite, we're using a one mil thick thread here which is a good strong thread, but it's, you've effectively got two layers there, so we've pulled through to one. Then when we come back the other way, when you're pulling that tail through, you've actually effectively got three thicknesses of that thread going through the hole. So it's quite a tight squeeze. Right, so we've got to the end of the run now. So effectively just locking off our last stitch, but because it's the end of the run, what I'm going to do is just come back one hole and try and find our way through there again. Now it's going to be really tight, so I'm going to get that in and give the needle just a little wiggle, making sure I'm holding on to both ends because you don't want to break the needle. Just open that hole up a little bit again because we're going to just take them through one last time. And this can be really tight. Sometimes you might just need to grab like a pair of pliers just to help you pull that through because we're getting a needle plus there's already thread in the hole so we're really asking a bit now of that initial hole that we created. I'm going to come back the other way still trying to pull a bit of that thread through to make sure we're not snagged. Wrap it over and again maybe use the pliers just to help us pull that tight. Needles can come off. I'm just going to pull it up now then we can use the same knife as before, just to trim them off nearly flush. And then if you like, depending on what type of thread it is, you might be able to use a lighter just to kind of singe those ends together and just to stop them, put a little ball on the end, stop them pulling through. But the fact that we've gone back on itself, it's just locked off in the hole, should be fine. So there we go, we've got our stitched shape now ready to mold it. Right, so we've got this stitched up now. It's just dawned on me where we beveled this outside edge. When this is bent round, it's gonna be quite tightly closed. So what would have been probably sensible was to use this beveler on the inside edge whilst it was still flat. But I've done this once or twice before. I'm gonna get away with, I think, coming in here and beveling it while uh, now it's stitched. But definitely on the inside edge here, it would be worth doing that. I think, before you stitch it up. So just coming from that bit there. It's just gonna mean that when that's closed, it's gonna be slightly open to accept the blade, hopefully. So the next stage we're gonna do is to wet mold it. Okay, so we mentioned about this having no metal fastenings that we're gonna to have to have tools to fit. So what we're gonna do is work out roughly where this is gonna fold over 
mark like a midpoint and then we're going to punch another hole on that point there and in this case I'm going to use a bit of leather thong you could use a bit of paracord just a piece of string but I'm also just going to trim this up around the hole a little bit to put a little bit of a point on it just to neaten this up a tiny bit So that's just going to come around there like so. So we're going to take a piece of this. Which way do we want it to be? Yeah, I think we'll have the knot on the inside. Just put a simple knot on the end of this. So the knot is on the inside then? I think, I think that's going to work the best. We'll see in a minute. So that's going to pull through like that. Yeah, I think that should wrap over okay. Could go either way actually. Could have the knot on the outside. But we can just leave a little bit of spare there. That's going to come round and then wrap round like so. So we want enough to go round the blade and then enough to tie off. So we just cut a little bit extra off to what we need. Cut it at the angle. It's going to be easier to poke back through itself kind of fasten it I think so we'll just end up doing that to kind of fasten it off okay now we're going to need to get this all wet now what we could do is just take take this off for now um, we know it we know it's going to work and we could wrap it up with with cling film or with a bit of paracord whatever because I'm, what I'm concerned about when you're going to be wet molding the, the dye that you want to use wants to be a water-based dye, ideally. You get oil-based dyes, which are then obviously slightly waterproof the leather. I'm pretty confident that this is a water-based dye that we've got on here. So we've got a tub of warm water, but obviously stains that are water-based and designed to stain leather are also going to stain our skin, probably. So I'm not going to pop a pair of gloves on, just in case. This is warm water. It doesn't have to be like out of the kettle hot just what comes out of your hot tap should be fine and we might find that it gives up a little bit of color when we get it in here so we're just going to pop that in and let it soak for a minute or so see if your bubbles coming out so the warm water basically will allow it to penetrate yeah, easier. you can see, yeah, we are getting a little bit of dye coming out, you see, you can just see it's starting to colour up the water a little bit. So while we're letting that soak, what we're going to do is just, we're going to be putting our blade into that moist environment. So I'm just going to get a bit of um, WD-40 or some kind of oil and just give the blade a wipe with that just to protect it a little bit while it's in that environment. And then I'm gonna wrap that in cling film, just so that when we take it off, we haven't got a, a rusty blade. We don't want loads of cling film on there, just enough to cover it up. Obviously it's not particularly thick material. But get rid of any excess and then squeeze it in. So that it's covering the blade but not excessively thick. All right, so that blade's hopefully now nicely protected. That's been soaking for a minute. So just take it out, squeeze off any excess. Just give that a little dab. And you see now it's nice and pliable. And when we bend it, it wants to hold that shape. So Just going to take off any excess there. We don't, you know, it doesn't need to be dripping wet. And you can see it's colouring up that cloth a little bit because some of the dye is coming out, but that's not a bad thing. The thread is waxed, so that should resist soaking up any dye. And then we can bend this round, put the blade in there. It might need a little bit of help just to open it up. 
get that nicely tucked in, bring that round and just form it a little bit to make it sit in there and then in theory that's that's all that should need we could bring that over and we could then wrap it up but obviously the more open to the air that we can leave it the quicker it's going to dry you could accelerate the drying process a little bit um, you could maybe put it in the oven on a really cool temperature but I think it's better just to let it dry naturally so we'll leave it like that maybe go and sit it out in the sunshine and when come you know come back to it, 24 hours is probably plenty of time to let that dry nicely. Let it do that, and then we'll come back to it, reattach the reattach the cord that's going to lock it up, and we'll be done. Okay, so we're back to this other design that we looked at, which has already been wet formed and dried. And if you remember, we were going to do a rivetless version and a stitchless version. So this this version hasn't been stitched, doesn't need to be stitched, but what it does need is some kind of fastening to set it. So we're going to look at two options and again these are all available from our friends Amy and Pete at Stonesfield. Um, you can get these snap setting kits and the snaps. So this is the actual one of the brass snaps that they do. So you've got two parts to this, or four parts in total. So one part is the receiver that gets riveted together through the leather and then the other part is a bit that you'll see on the outside, which is like the button that you're used to seeing. So those both get riveted through the leather and you need tools for those. If you buy kind of cheap sets from Haberdash and stuff, they sometimes come with these little flimsy plastic things, which are, yeah, they kind of do the job a few times, but they don't last very long. They come with various anvils. So you could, you know, you could go and buy like a, a cheap set of snaps and rivets. But if, again, if you're going to get into it, it's probably worth getting some proper kit so you're going to have the tools that set these set these rivets and snaps properly. There's also two different types of rivet that we can use. So I've just set a couple in this piece of leather. We're going to rivet this end together. We're just going to put one in the middle. But if you can see, one's got a, a clean side and then a not so clean side. And then this one's like a double a double sided one. So they're a couple of options. They're both going to be set with similar tools. What we're going to do is go with a slightly prettier version, which is this closed option. So you've got a post with a rivet head on it and then a socket with a rivet head on it. And they plug together again through the leather and get set. So that's what we're going to look at next. There's various tools that you know you can pick up either individually or in a or in a set. This is like a little anvil that takes a different size bits like this, so it supports the shape of the actual thing as you're hammering down on it to set it. Um, and then this is the one that's just like a an open curve for setting these rivets, the domed head, so it doesn't just squash it dead flat. If you notice, there's different sizes. What we want for this thinner leather is probably a line, a line 20, I think this size is. So it's a smaller size. It's not got such a tall post. So it's good for going through thinner stuff. For, th for going through thicker stuff, you just go for, go for a bigger one. So that's what we're gonna look at doing next. Okay, so we're gonna go about putting these holes in. We're gonna wanna mark a position again. So let's take roughly the center of this and make a mark. Okay, we're going to now find the punch that corresponds to the post on the on the actual snap. That looks about right. And then we're going to punch, open this up, and punch a hole. Using a little bit of scrap leather just to finish that off. And then we can close it up and again we're going to want the receiver to go on the inside part of the leather so we're just going to poke through the middle of that hole and make a mark on there which we can see and then you see i've opened this up to punch this so just while we've got that open you can see this was the one that we've just done we've stitched together which is like an l shape this is more like a p shape kind of 
the way this comes out of the uh, template. This leather is a little bit more pliable than the other stuff. I reckon the, the slightly thicker, stiffer leather will actually give a better result, but this is formed okay and it'll hold the shape. So we're just gonna punch this hole and set the, set the snap. But I just wanted to show you the difference in the two template shapes. It come out of a completely different shape piece of leather, really. So now we've got those holes to set the thing. But while we've got the, the punch in our hand, we might as well set the hole for the rivet as well. So right, we've got that bit on the inside. So in the middle, I'm just going to come and pop another hole through all three thicknesses there. So we've got a fold over there. Go through all three at once. And these are, you know, these are really quite handy things to have, these multi-hole punches. So let's do the easy bit first. Let's set the rivet. So we're going to poke a longer post through there. There's the cap, which has got a hole in it that it would actually just clip on. So it would kind of snap together just with your fingers. And there's a little swelling in there that will just hold it in place. Whilst we then find the relevant size on this little tiny anvil. And then the opposite side of that. So we've got the curved side of that, curved side in there, makes a similar shape. And we're just going to pop that down, pin it together, and just use a fairly light metal hammer and light taps. We're not going to have to do a huge amount before that's pinched down and set quite nicely. We can then open this up. We're going to want the flat side of the anvil for this. So this is the, the receiver part of the snap. So we've just got a post that's got this hollow tube in it that comes through the back of the leather. Sorry, this is the front. Comes through the back there. And then this part, which the snap actually fastens down onto, sits on top of that. And we want that to open up and sit on top of this anvil. Then we've got this little setting tool, which has got like a little domed ball on the end and then a flat section. So what it does is it actually mushrooms out this tube and it's really important that you don't just smash down on these. It's a case of taking light taps, moving the tool around a little bit and then it will start the process of just mushrooming that over. You can see now it's not a tube anymore, it's just like a top hat. Take your time. What's dead easy to do if you're not careful is that you just fold the post over. If you just come in and smash it once, you just crush it and it doesn't, doesn't seat and hold very nicely. There's just a little bit more to do on that to get it to sit nice and tight. There you go, nice light taps and we've got a good secure fastening there. And then this is basically the same except the bit that we're going to press down with our finger or thumb comes through the hole and that's got the tube in it. And then this receiver part, which has got a little lock ring inside that snaps down onto here. Because we've got this domed shape, we want to find the corresponding shape in this little anvil, which I think is that one there. See that fits all the way into there. So that helps just to support the shape of the snap fastening as you're setting it. So same sort of thing, we're coming down, same tool, Gently does it until that starts to dome over. And there we go, that's nicely set inside, nice and clean. It's not rotating. And that's what will punch to snap together like that. There is an alternative to that, which is called a Sam Brown stud. What these are is a ball on a post and they screw in from the back. So you punch the same hole here, but instead of having a snap fastening here, what you would have is a bigger hole punched, probably almost up to the maximum size hole. Our leather like this, punch that hole. And that in itself won't quite fit over that dome. So then you would take your knife and just cut in four little 
marks there. So this is an alternative that you don't technically need um, the fastening tools for. So you could put, you could stitch this end together, maybe, and then instead of the snap fastener, you could just screw this on. And then what happens is where, where you've cut those little slots, you see that allows that button to pop through, but it holds it fairly firm once it's through. Mm. So then to release it, you just peel it off like that. So that's called a Sam Brown stud. That's an alternative to this snap fastener. But now basically this one's done. So we can unwrap the cling film. And this one should be able to go in there. Fasten on, so that's that version with no stitching. Right, so here we have the two finished versions. This is the one with the metal hardware, which unpops and the knife comes out, goes back in. The other one is still drying a little bit, but it's taken it with its it's kind of taken its shape now, so you can see the wrap doing its job. It also helps to be able to pull that little flap out of the way. So it's still got the blade wrapped up in its cling film inside. And it's a bit sticky in there, So that, but that's holding the shape quite well now. So you can see what the wet forming has done. And then when that's completely dry, obviously you'll be able to take the cling film off the blade. And the idea of this one is we just pull that round, wrap this round, few times. Just pull that up. That should keep that pretty safe. So there's no metal hardware in that one. We just stitched it up and wrapped it up with the fastening. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Lee, thank you so much. Welcome, mate. My pleasure. So, a final recap. As mentioned at the very beginning of this video, this video is part of an ongoing series to do with spoon stroke hook knife sheaves. If you haven't seen the other videos, once again, links will be down below in the description to those videos. Highly recommend you go check those out. Uh, also, we'll be putting a link to uh, ways in which you can connect with Lee Stoffer down below, Instagram, etc. It will mean the world to me if you gain any value from this video whatsoever. At the very least, just give him uh, a follow over on Instagram. Also, you can see the myriad of work that he gets up to. Like I said, he is a professional green woodworker and also a tool maker. So there's a lot of cool stuff that he's been working on in the past and also currently. Finally, I will be putting a link below down to Stonesfield Leather, Amy & Co, who are fantastic and have kindly sponsored us in this video with the equipment they provided. So if you're on the hunt, uh, uh, on search for some leather equipment, we can highly recommend those guys. Link below to those. Also, like I said, the Mora spoon knives have been kindly uh, given to us by the team over at Classic Hand Tools, who are one of the UK's biggest retailers of hand tools when it comes to woodworking. So they have got a massive inventory of tools, etc. that I also recommend you highly check out. So if you're on the hunt for Mora spoon knives, etc., they're a fantastic place to go to. Once again, link below in the description to that. Lee, once again, I really do thank you uh, right. for allowing me to come and document your process. Just to kind of uh, finish off, and this is to kind of stress once again something we've said throughout the video, and that is there are many ways to approach this particular style of sheaf, isn't there? Absolutely, and I've, you know, it's not something that I've had to do or, or needed to do myself, but they're out there, they're a thing, and you could, you know, you can adapt the techniques that we've used and make a combination of the two, or try, you know, try your own ideas. The whole, the whole point was to show a few processes, wasn't yeah. it? To try and show the wet molding, you know, how you can work with a different material at the end of the day. So hopefully we've given people a bit of an idea to go away and do their own thing. Yeah, and even for myself as well, I've seen this sheath being made by different people, but even just watching you also just gave me a couple of ideas. Cool. Oh, actually, yeah, I didn't think about that. Uh, approaching it. So once again, a sincere thank you, Lee. Thanks, welcome. So guys, really hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to check out all the links below in the description and I shall see you on the next installment. As always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. For myself, Zell Outdoors and Lee Soffer, peace out.